Boston was emptied and scuttled. McQuinn's men had cut off the heads of Jewett's fellow crew members and forced him to identify them one by one. Then McQuinn held a potlatch. It was a feast, a dance, and a triumphant show of power, where a chief would welcome his guests by lavishing his excess riches on them. I had determined from the first of my capture to adopt a conciliating conduct toward them and conform myself as far as was in my power to their customs and mode of thinking, trusting that the same divine goodness that had rescued me from death would not always suffer me to languish in captivity among these heathens. Jewett was exposed to an unbelievable wealth of ancient nations, among them the Nutka, the Maka, the Haida, the Salish, and the Kwakutl. They cut through the ocean in huge hand-carved cedar canoes. They were artists and dancers, mystics and whalers, headhunters and cannibals. They boasted great wealth, worshipped wolf spirits and thunderbirds. Jewett became a constant companion to McQuinnah at Nootka and on his visits to other tribes. Summers turned into winters, and still no rescue ships came into the sound. Meanwhile, to McQuinnah, Jewett became less of a slave and more of a son, so much so that in time he arranged for Jewett to be married. I remonstrated against this decision, but to no purpose, for he told me that should I refuse, I would be put to death. A blacksmith from England, now a husband at Nootka. Jewett fell further into the world of Nootka Sound, succumbing to its customs and rhythms. He even came to comprehend the massacre of his crewmates on the Boston. Here, I cannot but indulge a reflection that has frequently occurred to me on the manner in which our people behave towards the natives. For though they are a thievish race, yet I have no doubt that many of the melancholy disasters have principally arisen from the imprudent conduct of some of the captains and crews of the ships employed in this trade in exasperating them by insulting, plundering, and even killing them on slight grounds. On the morning of the 19th of July, a day that will be ever held by me in grateful remembrance of the mercies of God. My ears were saluted by the joyful sound of three cannon and the cries of the inhabitants exclaiming, Strangers, white men. It was an American ship, the Lydia. McQuinnah wanted to trade, but he feared retribution for the massacre of the Boston's crew. He could neither read nor write, so he turned to Jewett to compose a letter of introduction to the American captain. He said, John, you know lie. But Jewett did lie. He wrote a rescue plea that sent McQuinna into a trap. I found McQuinna in irons with a guard over him. He looked very melancholy, but on seeing me his countenance brightened up. I asked the captain's permission to take off his irons, assuring him that as I was with him, there was no danger of his being in the least troublesome. McQuinnah bartered some otter skins for a great coat. Then, he made ready to leave the Lydia and do it. I felt a sincere pleasure in freeing from fetters a man who, though he had caused the death of my poor comrades, had nevertheless always proved my friend and protector. Then, grasping both my hands with much emotion, as the tears trickled down his cheeks, he bade me farewell and stepped into the canoe which immediately paddled him on shore. Notwithstanding my joy at my deliverance and the pleasing anticipation I felt of once more beholding a civilized country and again being permitted to offer up my devotions in a Christian church. I could not avoid experiencing a painful sensation on parting with this savage chief 
who had preserved my life. And, in general, treated me with kindness. John Jewett never shook the effects of his time among the Nutka. He wrote a book about his adventure. He turned that into a song, then a play, and went around peddling his tale to anyone who would listen. It haunted him until he died at age 37. Years later, a French trader sailed into Nootka Sound. It was quiet, except for the approach of an aging, arthritic man in a canoe. He was carrying a small load of otter pelts. He was McQuinna, and he was still eager to trade. 